Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to historic Moody Coliseum and to the Forum on Leadership closing conversation with Jeff Bezos. I hope you're glad to be here. My name is Brad Cheeves, and I serve as Vice President for Development and External Affairs here at the university, and SMU is honored to co-host this afternoon's closing conversation with the Bush Presidential Center, and I'm so glad so many of you are able to join us this evening. This has been a great week for SMU and the Bush Center, and we know tonight will be a fantastic conversation. Thank you for being here, and now please join me in welcoming to the podium the 10th president of SMU, Dr. R. Gerald Turner. Thank you, Brad, and I'm too delighted to have all of you here. This is the kind of event that we envisioned uh, when we were talking to the Bushes about having the library here, that for big events, Moody Coliseum would be the perfect place. I'd take advantage of this opportunity also for us to take a moment to acknowledge the loss all of us feel and our country feels for the passing of Ms. Barbara Bush. In the words of her son, George W. Bush, Barbara Bush was a fabulous first lady, a woman like, unlike any other who brought love and literacy to millions. That's why we have our white ribbons on, as Laura said, signifying her hair and those three strands of pearls. So would you join me for a moment of silence in honor of the memory of Barbara Bush? Thank you. Tonight not only marks the conclusion of the Bush Center's inaugural forum on leadership, but it also occurs on the fifth anniversary of the dedication of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, which includes the library, the museum, and the George W. Bush Institute. Our pride in being home to the George W. Bush Presidential Center, as we would say at SMU, it's unbridled. It's been 10 years since SMU was announced as the home of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. And in that time, SMU's partnered with the President and First Lady on initiatives that have truly enriched the lives of countless students, faculty, and staff. Several programs have benefited from the experts and unique resources available at the Bush Center. Over 100 students have interned there. Dozens of faculty members have participated in programs and studies. And of course, our students, our faculty members, and their families regularly visit the museum to learn from the holdings and the special exhibitions. Following the dedication of the center in April 2013, over one million people have visited the library and museum, many walking the SMU campus for the very first time. The president didn't graduate from SMU, but he did the next best thing. He married in. And we are always proud of the fact that Laura graduated from SMU and is a member of our Board of Trustees. And the President drops in to various classes from time to time, in fact, two last week. And any time that he's on campus, when they see those SUVs with a dark window circling, then the, the texts start flying because they know that he's going to be speaking somewhere. And obviously, it's wonderful to have them here for so many basketball games. He is greeted every time with W, W, W. And I'm sure the players enjoy it too because they want to shake his hand. So tonight is very special for the entire SMU community. In honor of this occasion, the SMU Board of Trustees passed a resolution commemorating the 10th anniversary of SMU's res selection as the site and the fifth anniversary of its opening. We have those resolutions out in the lobby that if you didn't see them on the way in, hopefully you will on your way out. So on behalf of the SMU community, we again thank the President, Mrs. Bush, and the Bush Selection Committee that was chaired by Don Evans for the unique honor it's been to collaborate with the Bush Presidential Center for the past five years. The partnership makes us both stronger. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce two graduates of Princeton. The old guy, an 85 graduate, Ken Hirsch, president and CEO of the Bush Center, and an 86 graduate coming along right behind him, 
Jeff Bezos, founder and CEO of Amazon. So please join me and welcome them to SMU. Well, Jeff, welcome to Dallas. Um, I'm excited that you can see what a city that really wants you here looks like. Right, guys? <laughs> Sorry, um, that was too tempting. So uh, I've left 30 seconds here and just in case there's a little real estate deal that you want to miss. <laughs> it's very nice to be here. All right, I tried. I tried. The um, before we get started, I do want to I do want to thank uh, the sponsors tonight: Amarillo National Bank and Highland Capital Management. Uh, this is a, a multi-faceted uh, event. We're here with SMU, our great partner. We're here as the uh, Engage event sponsored by Highland Capital, and we're also here as the culminating conversation of our forum on leadership. And this has been a great couple of days with Bono, Priscilla Chan, Governors Hickenlooper, and Martinez. Ben Bernanke, Hank Paulson, many others, and Condi Rice and President and Mrs. Bush talking about leadership. So I want to talk about leadership. Yeah. Um, and the um, the first thing to really talk about is to I want to take you back to uh, to the beginning. And in 1995, you started. Yep. You went public in '97. Mm -hmm. And I'll adjust for stock splits, but you you raised stock. You ra you issued shares at a dollar fifty a share. That's right. In 1988, your revenue was six hundred million dollars. And you lost 125 million, but your stock had gone to $55 a share. So you doubled down. Sales went up threefold. You lost another 400 million, but your stock went up to $76, $27 billion of market cap. Your personal net worth of 9 billion. Take us back to that time where the market is telling you you're doing great, but you have red ink in the company. You took on $2 billion of debt from 99 to 01. While you tripled, while you doubled sales yet again, what were you thinking back then? Well, that's a great, uh, great question, and it is kind of fun to go back and think about those days. Um, you know, in those days when we had, I don't know, when I started the company, and there was just one person, and then there were ten people, and you know, today there are almost six hundred thousand people. So there's a lot of change. But back in that time, we were still a pretty small company um, by most standards. But we were we were growing fast, and it was very exciting. You know, I had when I started, I was driving all the packages to the post office myself. Um, I knew the UPS guy so well that he would let me in even like five minutes after closing. So it was. Um, I hoped one day we'd be able to afford a forklift. It was that kind of operation. We were so inefficient with our operations and logistics in those early days when there were just 10 of us that I didn't have packing tables. We were packing on the floor on our hands and knees. And uh, I said to one of the software engineers who was packing alongside me, you know what we should do? We should get knee pads. And he looked at me like I was the dumbest guy he'd ever seen in his life. And he said, Jeff, we should get packing tables. <laughs> and we, next day I got packing tables and it doubled our productivity. And so, uh, but by the, in the era you're talking about, uh, we, had, we had gone public. And you're right, it, on a split adjusted basis, it's a dollar fifty a share in today's terms. And the market became very quickly a uh, kind of an internet uh, bubble kind of market, and the stock prices went up very, very high. When I raised the initial uh, funding for Amazon, I had to talk to 60 prospective investors to raise a million dollars, and I raised a million dollars from 22 different investors, $50,000 at a time, and they got 20% of the company for a million dollars. And that was in 95. But just three years, two or three years later, 
um, you know, uh, Stanford MBA with no business experience could raise $25 million with a single phone call if they had an internet business plan. So the whole thing in just two or three years, the excitement, uh, uh, really, is, as we could, would shortly see when the bubble burst in the year 2000, the hyperbolic excitement about the internet had infected everybody. And uh, I, I, I was, I knew that there was, that we had a fund, there, I liked our business, and I liked the fundamentals of our business, but I also knew that the stock price was disconnected from what we were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and so I was always preaching, we would have all hands meetings, and there, it was a small number of employees at that time, but, you know, probably, let's see, in uh, 97, I think we would have had a few hundred employees, we would have all hands meetings, and I would say, look, you know, you got to remember the great quote from Benjamin Graham that in the short run, the stock market is a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. So don't think about the daily stock price. Because it was going up every day. The stock price was going up. And uh, I didn't want, because all the employees had stock options, and I didn't want them counting their success that way. And so I would say, look, when the stock is up 30% in a month, don't feel 30% smarter. Because when it's down 30% in a month, then you're going to have to feel 30% dumber. And it's not going to feel as good. Right. <laughs> and it was good that I kind of laid that groundwork because, you know, sure enough, in the year 2000, the whole thing uh, came tumbling down. I think Amazon went stock back to about $6. Went down to $6. And that, I don't even know yeah. if that's on a split yeah. adjusted basis. Yeah. I think that's probably, that was below, that was on a split adjusted basis, probably below a dollar. So, and did yeah. you ever doubt the business model at that point? No. So I, you know, it's very interesting to me, because I had all the internal uh, metrics on, you know, how many customers we had and what was going on, and I could see people thought we were losing money because we were selling dollar bills for 90 cents, even though we were very clear that we were not. We were, we had high fixed costs, and but we had contribution margin, positive contribution margin. And I just knew that it was a fixed cost business, and as soon as we reached a sufficient scale, we would have a, a very good business. And so that was that understanding of the fixed uh, nature of our expenses relative to physical world retail is what led us to have the get big fast strategy. We knew that it would be, uh, that our economics would be very much improved if we could have a sufficient scale. So, so we worked hard on and that. And so, so at that time, you're, you're preaching the benefits of e-commerce and, and really yeah. disintermediating the business. So fast forward to today, now we have content, we have physical Amazon stores, we have Amazon cashierless stores, yeah. which we used to call shoplifting. And, and then now yeah. you now- It's shoplifting without the jail time. That's right. And then, and then, and then buying Whole Foods yeah. here for a Texas company. So how does, that, how does that fit together your vision? And then how do you manage these disparate businesses with, with different cost structures now? Yeah, well, um, and by the way, just maybe, just finishing up a little on that prior point before I answer that question, I, and, and also with um, you know, the memory of Barbara Bush uh, in all of our minds, I, I think part of, if you're, in, a lot of people in this room are entrepreneurs, started their own businesses, done various things, taken risks of various kinds. And I think the, uh, one of the precursors, one of the foundational things to being able to take risk is to have had some kind of support from somebody. You have to have some mentors. You have to have somebody who loves you. These are the kind of things that build up and allow you to kind of, you know, jump off into uncharted terrain and do something new because you know you have a support system of one kind or another. And, uh, and I certainly did. So I, for, for me, I just want to point out that I, I, I feel very strongly that um, there's a lot, I've won a lot of lotteries. Uh, Amazon is one of the lotteries that I've won, but I had a big lottery with my parents. My dad is a Cuban immigrant. He came here when he was 16 years old, didn't speak any English. Uh, my, he's, he's a great guy. And my uh, mother had, her, uh, had me when she was 17 years old. So she was a pregnant 16-year-old in Albuquerque, New Mexico in high school, which was not cool. And... Uh, she made it work, and her, her parents, my grandparents, helped her with that whole thing and made, made that all work. And if you don't get that kind of support somehow, it doesn't have to be your parents. Sometimes people get lucky. It's a grandparent or it's a friend or a family friend or a teacher. It can be somebody. But you need that. Somebody has to step into your life 
And that's a lottery that I suspect a lot of people in this room have also won, just like me. So the question Go, is, Amazon yeah, Go. And and all the, the, we do so many different things. So this is the question I sometimes get. How can you do so many different things? Why don't you stick to the knitting? The kind of traditional advice would be to stay focused and keep the business simple. And I, I, the, the way I think about this is we actually do stick to one thing. It's just not um, described. It's not the business itself. We do web services, which is you know big enterprises buying compute services from us. And we have our retail business. And we have Amazon Studios, which is making original content. And Amazon Go, the things you listed. So, but the, the cultural thread that runs through all these things is the same. We only have a few principles at Amazon, kind of core values that we go back to over and over again. And if you looked at each of the things that we do, you would see those run straight through everything. So the first one, and by far the most important one, is customer obsession. And we talk about it as customer obsession as opposed to competitor obsession. And I have seen over and over again companies talk about that they're customer focused, but really when I pay close attention to them, I believe they are competitor focused. And that's just a completely different mentality. By the way, competitor focus can work, um, but I don't think it works in the long run as well as customer focused. For one thing, once you're the leader, if your whole culture is competitor obsessed, it's kind of hard to stay energized and motivated if you're out in front. Um, whereas customers are always unsatisfied. They're always discontent. They always want more. And so no matter how far you get out there in front of your competitors, you're still behind your customers. So they're always pulling you along. So customer obsession is a deep principle that underlies everything we do. Another one is eagerness to invent. So we love to pioneer. And when we have done, by the way, whenever we have tried to do something in a kind of me too fashion, we have failed at it. Um, we need to have something that is differentiated, unique, uh, something that customers are going to like that we're kind of leading with. So that's another element that works for us. And then uh, another one is long term thinking. We are willing to, uh, to, to take some time and be patient with our business initiatives, and that runs through everything. So a lot of our competitors might have, have two to three year kind of time frames, and we might have more of a five to seven year sort of time frame. And then the last one, operational excellence. So li literally, you know, how do you have high standards around you know, identifying defects, fixing defects at the root, all of those kinds of things that lead to what I think also can be in a simpler way just stated as professionalism, that you want to do things right just for the sake of doing them right. So let, let's talk about that uh, with, a, with another, I guess this is a corollary. Now that you have about 600,000 employees, I calculate it, you're adding about 250 people a day. Um, you've mentioned that you're trying to fend off day two. Yeah. And you've said that day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciatingly painful decline, followed by death. Yeah. That is why it is always day one. Yeah. I, so I, yeah. How's that work? Well, so day one, um, this is a phrase that we use at Amazon all the time. I've been using it in my first annual shareholder letter from 20 years ago. Um, and we say it's always day one. And it needs to be day one for the reason that you just mentioned. Um, and how do you, so the real question for me is how do you go about maintaining a day one culture? You know, it's great to have the, um, the scale of Amazon. We have financial resources. We have lots of brilliant people. We can accomplish great things. We have global scope. We have operations all over the world. But the downside of that is that you can lose your nimbleness. You can lose your entrepreneurial spirit. You can lose your that kind of heart that, the, the, that, um, that small companies often have. And so if you could have the best of both worlds, if you can have that entrepreneurial spirit and heart, while at the same time having all the advantages that come with scale and scope, think, think of the things that you could do. And, and so how, the question is, how do you achieve that? Um, the, the scale is good because it makes you robust. You know, a, a, a big boxer can take a punch to the head. The question is, you also want to dodge those punches. So you'd like to be nimble 
They want to be big and nimble. And I find that there are a lot of things that are protective of the day one mentality. I already spent some time on one of them, which is customer obsession. I think that's the most important thing. If you can, and it gets harder as you get bigger. When you're a little tiny company, say you're a 10 person startup company, every single person in the company is focused on the customer. When you get to be a bigger company, you've got all the middle, you've got middle managers and you've got all these layers and the, those people aren't on the front lines. They're not interacting with customers every day. They're insulated from customers and they start to manage not the customer uh, happiness directly, but they start to manage through proxies like metrics and processes and some of those things can become bureaucratic. So it's very challenging. But one of the things that happens is the decision making velocity slows down. And I think the reason, one of the reasons that that happens is that people, all say junior executives inside the big company start to uh, model all decisions as if they are heavyweight, irreversible, highly consequential decisions. And so even two-way doors, you could make, you make a decision, it's the wrong decision, you can just back up, back through the door and try again. Even those reversible decisions start to be made with heavyweight processes. And so you can teach people that these pitfalls and, and, and traps and then teach them to avoid those traps. And that's what we're trying to do at Amazon so that we can maintain our inventiveness and our heart and our kind of small company spirit even as we have the scale and scope of a larger company. So 600,000 people, small company, which that's a, that's a trick. So I, I know the Bush Center, we focus on leadership. And I know that you're also a voracious reader. Um, and you're fond of a book by Nassim Tlaib called The Black Swan. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it's, it's about human tendencies to reduce, thing to anecdote, reduce things to anecdotal stories um, and to shield us from sort of the randomness of the way things actually happen. Building narratives. Yeah. And, and how, how we do can, you we humans can that? create a narrative around anything. To connect any sequence of facts, we can create a narrative. So how, how do you infect that uh, throughout the whole organization when you have that many, that many layers? Well, um, I, I think that, you know, what I would say about that, and it's really a little different from the way that, um, that Black Swan talks about anecdotes, the way you're talking about, but I'm actually a big fan of anecdotes in business, not building a narrative structure around them necessarily, but I still have uh, an email address that customers can write to. I see most of those emails and I don't answer very many of them anymore, but, but I see them. And I, and I forward them, uh, some of them, the ones that catch my curiosity, I forward them to the executives in charge of that area with, with a question mark. And that question mark is just a shorthand for, can you look into this? Why is this happening? What does it, what's going on? And what I find is very interesting, because we have tons of metrics. We have you know weekly business reviews with these metric decks, and we look at our, we know, so many things about customers and their, uh, their, you know, whether we're delivering on time, uh, what, you know, whether the uh, packages have too much air in them and, you know, wasteful of packaging and so on. We have so many metrics that we monitor. And the thing I have noticed is that when the anecdotes and the data disagree, the anecdotes are usually right. There's something wrong with the way you're measuring it. And that's why it's so important to, to keep your, you need the, to run something that you, where you're doing, you know, uh, shipping billions of packages a year. For sure, you need good data and metrics. Are you delivering on time? Are you delivering on time in every city? Are you delivering on time to apartment complexes? Are you delivering on time in certain countries? You do need the data. But then you need to check that data with your intuition and your instincts. And you need to teach that to the, all the senior executives uh, and, and junior executives too. So if you're not answering your emails, can you give us your cell phone? Maybe a text is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, oh my uh, God. Still have the two pizza rule and no PowerPoints? Oh yeah, the two pizza team. We try to, we try to uh, uh, create teams that are no larger than can be fed with two pizzas. We call that the two pizza team rule. Um, no PowerPoints are used inside of Amazon. Uh, so every meeting, we have the, when we hire a new executive from the outside, <laughs> this is the weirdest 
meeting culture you will ever encounter, and new executives have a little bit of, you know, culture shock in their first Amazon meeting, because what we do is somebody for the meeting has prepared a six-page memo, a narratively structured memo that is got, you know, real sentences and topic sentences and <laughs> verbs and nouns, not just bullet points. And it lays out and supposed to create the context for what will then be a good discussion. So, and then we read those memos silently in the meeting. So it's like a study hall. And we do that, everybody sits around the table and we read silently for usually about half an hour, however long it takes us to read the document. And then we discuss it. And it's so much better than the typical PowerPoint presentation for so many reasons. I could talk about this for all of so our nobody time. Eats the, no, nobody's eating the pizza at that point because we're sitting around. No pizza they, they, usually at now, that point. They, now, you know. One author said yeah. that that takes you back to River Oaks Elementary School in Houston where you started, where they started with a reading, with a silent reading exercise. Uh, I, I never made that connection, but I, <laughs> you know, you never know where things come from. Uh, I did have a great experience there. Yeah. So, but I definitely recommend the memo over the PowerPoint. And the reason we read them in the room, by the way, is because just like, you know, high school kids, executives will bluff their way through the meeting as if they've read the memo. <laughs> because we're busy, and so uh, you've got to actually carve out the time for the memo to get read. And that's what the first half hour of the meeting is for. And then everybody's actually read the memo. They're not just pretending to have read the memo. <laughs> That's pretty effective. How has your <laughs> how has your leadership style changed uh, over the years? Um, it's changed a lot, mostly just because it's had to. You know, the company has changed so much, and uh, I can't. You know, the company is ten people or a hundred people. I can be involved in every decision, not just you know, not just the objectives, like what are we going to do, but even the methods. How are we going to do it? Uh, and a, as the company gets bigger. Uh, you know, the CEO or the founder or whoever it is leading the company cannot uh, be involved in all of those decisions. They certainly cannot uh, be involved in the methods of how things are going to get done. So you do have to change your leadership approach as the company scales. Um, but, the, 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 but the principles of the company have not changed. In fact, I probably spend more of my time now on culture and uh, setting trying to set high standards for things for, for the, like customer obsession and um, uh, uh, inventiveness and things like that. So for me, I'm, I'm kind of a teacher now, so it's changed quite a bit. And I have this great luxury. I love my job. I tap dance into work. Even I, get back, I just got back from an amazing vacation in Norway. Um, I got to go dog sledding and go to a wolf preserve and all this really cool stuff. But I couldn't wait to get back to work because it's so fun. And the reason, one of the reasons it's fun for me is I get to work in the future. So my job, I'm, I'm, I, I have very um, uh, limited kind of day-to-day -day operational uh, needs. That, you know, I'm, I've constructed my job so that I don't have to be pulled into the present. I can stay two or three years in the future. And actually, I'm, I'm, I'm always advising my senior team, the people who report to me, that they should organize themselves in the same way. We're big enough now that they need to be able to look around corners. They can't be, if something pulls me into the present, it's because something has gone wrong. Um, you know, and, and we need to you know, kind of figure it's a, it's a firefighting exercise. And that's not how you should be running a business of this scale. So it's changed a lot. Okay. So, um Following up with that, you were quoted as saying, I believe you have to be willing to be misunderstood oh, if you're God, going yes. to innovate. So how are you misunderstood if you're going to do, Amazon? If you're going to do anything new or innovative, you have to be willing to be misunderstood. And if you can't tolerate that, then for God's sake, don't do anything new or innovative. Um, every important thing we've done has been misunderstood um, so often by well-meaning, sincere critics, sometimes, of course, by self-interested, uh, insincere critics. But, but, you know, I'll give you an example. A thousand years ago, we started this thing called customer reviews. 
and we let customers review books. We only sold books at that time. And customers could come in and rate a book between one and five stars, and they could write a text-based review. You guys are very familiar with this. It's now a very normal thing. But back then, this was crazy. And the, uh, the publishers, the book publishers, did not like this. Because, of course, not all the reviews are positive. And the, uh, I got a letter from one publisher that said, I have a good idea for you. Why don't you just publish the positive customer <laughs> reviews? And I thought about this. And, cause, and he, his, the argument he was making to me is that our sales would go up if we just published the positive customer reviews. And I thought about this, and I thought, I don't, I don't actually believe that, because I don't think we make money when we uh, sell something. We make money when we help someone make a purchase decision. And it's just a slightly different way of looking at it, because people are, the part of what they're paying us for is helping them make a purchase decision. And if you think about it that way, then you want the negative reviews, too. And, of course, it has been extremely helpful for people to have negative customer reviews. And, by the way, it's come full circle now, where the product manufacturers use the customer reviews to improve the next generation of the product. So it's actually helping the whole ecosystem. But and now nobody criticizes customer reviews. And in fact, if you were in the, in, you know, here in the year 2018, if some e-commerce company were to say, we're only going to publish the positive customer reviews, that would be the crazy thing that would get criticized. So the new and innovative quickly becomes um, the new normal. And then it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the new incumbent idea, and then it doesn't get uh, criticized. When, by the way, more generally, what I preach at Amazon to all of our employees is when we are criticized, there is a simple uh, process that you need to go through, which is first you look yourself in the mirror and decide, is your critic right? Do you agree? Are we doing something wrong? If you are, change. And by the way, if you look yourself in the mirror and you decide that your critic is wrong, as we did with the customer reviews, then do not change, no matter how much pressure is brought to bear. Do the right thing in that case as well. Um, have a deep keel. You have to have a deep keel. Good. So um, why don't we shift to personal, um, away from Amazon a little bit. Um, if, if you could write your legacy what would you want your legacy to read? World's oldest man. <laughs> That's, uh, I stole that. That's not original. Um, but I would love it. Let's work on that. I, I keep telling my biotech friends, hurry. <laughs> what the hell, guys? Come on. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm probably... Uh, if you think long term, and I can talk about this at great length, um, but long term, the thing, if you take a really long run view, you know, many decades, maybe even a couple of hundred years, I think the most important work that I'm doing, and I get increasing conviction on this with every passing year, is the work I'm doing at Blue Origin okay. on space travel. Okay. Well, why don't, why don't, why, well, why don't we talk about that? Okay. Um, because I think, I think from a vision standpoint, um, I think people should appreciate the horizon that you have. So yeah. let's talk about your kind of, you, I'll call it your near-term objectives, let's yeah. say 75 years, yeah. and then your long-term objectives 100 to 300 years from now. Well, so first of all, you don't choose your passions. Your passions choose you. And all of us are gifted with certain passions, and the people who are lucky are the ones who get to follow those things. And I always advise our uh, young employees, I meet with interns and so on, you can have, and my kids too, you can have a job, or you can have a career, or you can have a calling. And if you can somehow figure out how to have a calling, you have hit the jackpot, because that's the big deal. And uh, most people don't ever get there. You know, you're very lucky if you have a career. A lot of people end up with a job. And so, um, you know, for me, I have been interested in rockets, space travel, propulsion, since I was a five-year-old boy. 
and I have spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about it. So it's not like I really have a choice to follow this passion. It has captured me. But I think it's very important um, that we go out into space as a civilization. And uh, the reason is not the one that, you, that I think is very common. There are many reasons that are, that are given. One of the reasons that is out there, and it's a very old idea, and one of the people who first articulated it um, very uh, well was Arthur C. Clarke. He said, all civilizations become spacefaring or extinct. And that even may be technically true in a long run, kind of long enough horizon. But um, that um, idea is one of the, it has kind of come to be that we need a, we've got all our eggs in one basket, and we need a plan B. You know, if we had a civilization elsewhere on another planet, somewhere in the solar system, then when Earth gets destroyed, humanity will still be fine. I find this particular argument incredibly unmotivating. We, we have now sent robotic probes to every planet in this solar system. Believe me, this is the best one. <laughs> it is not close. My friends who want to move to Mars, I say, I have an idea for you. Why don't you first, for a year, move to the top of Mount Everest? Because the top of Mount Everest is a garden paradise <laughs> compared to Mars. And, um, and so it's a, uh, uh, w this planet is a gym. This planet is unbelievable. And as you travel around, uh, the more you travel around, you, the more you see how incredible it is. And I'm not even just talking about nature. I'm talking about the civilization we built and the urban cities that we have. And, all of this, this, these amazing things. Um, and so we need to protect it. Now, and I'm not even talking about protecting it from asteroids or nuclear holocaust or anything, so all, the, all these things are probably uh, important and valid. But we don't need to worry about that because we have something more certain that is a problem. And that is if you take current baseline energy usage on Earth today, global energy usage, and compound that at just 3% a year, then in just a few hundred years, you're going to have to cover the entire surface of the Earth in solar cells. That's how powerful compounding is. So, and by the way, we have been growing energy usage at a few percent a year for a long time. So, and, and, we, and we, our civilization has a lot of advantages because we increase our energy usage. The human body, if we, in a state of nature, if you are just an animal in the state of nature, your body, your metabolic rate, uses about 100 watts of power. But a modern person living in a developed country, you actually use, you're, 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 you're all in civilizational per capita metabolic rate is 11,000 watts. We use a lot of energy. That's about as much energy as a blue whale uses. And so we have, you know, there are billions of us, and most of us don't even, aren't even really living uh, in the kind of lifestyle of a developed country yet, but they will be very soon, and we hope they will be. We want them to. And so you're going to face a choice, and you won't face this choice, and I won't face this choice, but your grandchildren's grandchildren will face this choice. Do you want to live in a world of stasis? Or do you want to have a trillion humans living in the solar system? Because the solar system is big. Earth is small. We capture a tiny, Earth's surface is so small, it captures a tiny, tiny fraction of the solar output. So once you go out into space, you have, for practical purposes, once again, unlimited resources. And the solar system can easily support a trillion humans. If you had a trillion humans, then you'd have a thousand Mozarts and a thousand Einsteins and so on and so on. That would be a dynamic, incredible civilization in which you would want your grandchildren's grandchildren to live in. I think ultimately, Earth becomes zoned, you know, residential and light industrial. 
<laughs> and um, you know, we'll have universities here and, and beautiful parks and houses, and, uh, but we won't have big factories here. All of that will be much better done in space where we have access to much higher quality resources. Uh, and so that's going to take several, you know, that's a multi uh, hundred year uh, vision. And my piece of this vision is I'm taking my Amazon lottery winnings and I'm converting them into reusable rocket vehicles so that we can lower the cost of access to space. Because right now the price of admission to do interesting things in space is just too high. If I look at what Amazon was able to do 20 years ago, we didn't have to build a transportation network. It already existed. That heavy lifting was in place. We didn't have to build a payment system. That heavy lifting had already been done. It was the credit card system. We didn't have to build, um, put a computer at every desk. That had already been done too, mostly for playing games, by the way, and so on. So all the pieces of heavy lifting were already in place 20 years ago. And that's why, as a, with a million dollars, I could start this company. Today, you know, and, and then there are even better examples on the internet over the last 20 years. You know, uh, Facebook started in a dorm room. Uh, I guarantee you two kids cannot build a giant space company in their dorm room. It's impossible. But I want to create the heavy lifting infrastructure, kind of do the hard part, so that a future, the future generation, two kids in a dorm room, will be able to create a giant space company. So that's the goal. And then, because, yeah, thank you, you're not going to... You're not going to achieve the vision that I just laid out of a trillion humans living in space and having this dynamic world um, without a big industry made up of thousands of companies. But it has to start with making the vehicles much more productive. And right now, you use a rocket once and you throw it away. Uh, and that is just a very expensive way to do business. So can I talk then uh, about another element with, uh, to get you to discuss your vision? Um, this may not be germane to the work you're doing, but, I'm, but you, are, uh, you are one of the great thinkers. Um, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Pros and cons. We've heard um, yeah. people talk about the great benefits. We've heard about disrupting and changing and leaving off us all in, yeah. in a jobless society. We've heard uh, autonomous weapons are a disaster. Yeah. Where do you fall on, the, uh, on your vision of where in artificial intelligence is going to go? And also um, some of the, I think, some of the more cautionary, and also some yeah. of the benefits. There. Well, um, you mentioned a few things there. Each of those is worth visiting because they're different. I think autonomous weapons are extremely scary. Um, I think it's a big, and you, by the way, do not need um, general AI. So right now, the things that we know how to do, you, would, you should think of those things as what is called narrow AI, um, things like machine vision and so on. To build incredibly scary autonomous weapons, you do not need general AI. The techniques that we already know and understand are perfectly adequate. And these weapons, some of the ideas that people have for these weapons are, in fact, very scary. Um, and so I don't know what the solution to that, but smart people need to be thinking about that, doing a lot of R&D. Is, is there a kind of uh, you know, multi, uh, it'd have to be a big treaty like the Geneva Convention or something that would help regulate these weapons because you, it, they're actually, uh, they have a lot of issues. So that one I think is genuinely scary. The idea that there's gonna be a general AI overlord that subjugates us or kills us all, I think is not something to worry about. I think that is overhyped. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm, first of all, we don't know, we're nowhere close to knowing how to build a general AI, something that could set its own objectives. We have no idea. We, we don't even, it's not even hardly, it's, it's not even a valid research area. We're so, we're so far back on that one. Um, so that's a, I think that's a very long-term prospect that it could even happen. But second of all, I think it's unlikely that such a thing's first instincts would be to exterminate us. Um, it, it seems, that would seem surprising to me. Maybe unemploy us. Much more likely it will help us. You know, um, uh, because we you know we're perfectly capable of hurting ourselves. You know, maybe we could use some help. Um, so I'm optimistic about that one, and certainly don't think we need to worry about it today. And then the jobless. You know, are we gonna? Is AI gonna put everybody out of work? I am not worried about this. I 
I, I find that people, all of us, I include myself, we are so unimaginative about what future jobs are going to look like and what they're going to be. You know, if I took you back in time 100 years, when, every, when almost everyone was a farmer, and I told, you know, we're, have, we're at some big farming convention or something, and I say, in the year 2018, there is going to be a job occupation called massage therapist. <laughs> they would not have believed you. <laughs> and in fact, I was telling this story to a friend, and they said, Jeff, forget massage therapist. There are dog psychiatrists. <laughs> and I, I went... I you went probably and, find one on Amazon. I went and looked that up on the internet. Sure <laughs> enough, you, you can easily hire a psychiatrist for your dog. And so... What, you know, there is, um, we're, we, 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 we humans like to do things and we like to be productive and we will figure out things to do um, and we will use these tools to make ourselves more powerful and, and in fact, what I predict is that jobs will get more engaging. Yes. Because you have to remember, you know, a lot of the jobs today are, are quite routine um, they are not necessarily uh, anybody's, as I said before, career or calling. And so I predict that because of um, artificial intelligence and its ability to automate certain tasks that in the past were impossible to automate, that not only will we have a much wealthier civilization, but that the quality of work will go up very significantly and that a higher fraction of people will have callings and careers relative to today. So can I, uh, can I bring you back down to, down to the present a little bit, and then I'd be remiss if I didn't use some of our time, um, on your personal purchase uh, of the Washington Post. Yeah. Um, so you buy the Washington Post a few years ago. Is it, is it going the way you thought it would go? Much better, much faster. So the Post is profitable today. So I bought the Post in 2013. The Post was... Um, uh, uh, a, still a fantastic institution at that time, but it was in great financial difficulty. Uh, it's a fixed cost business, as most of, almost all publishing is. And their revenues uh, over about six years from sort of 2007, 2008 to uh, 2013 had been cut in half from a billion dollars a year to half a billion dollars a year. And that, uh, in a fixed cost business, puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the business. They, were, they had needed to reduce the size of the newsroom, lay off um, reporters, and, and um, it was very difficult. And Don Graham, whose family had owned the paper for a long period of time, he uh, contacted me through an intermediary, actually. We, and we'd known each other probably for almost 20 years, actually. And I was very surprised, but he said that he was interested in selling the paper. Um, and he wanted to, uh, he, I said, look, I, I'm not the right buyer, Don, because I don't know anything about the newspaper business. And he said, we don't need any of that. We've got lots of people who understand the newspaper business. We need somebody who understands the internet better. Um, and this was a great act of love of Don's because the paper had been their family for a long time and he cared more about the paper than he cared about his ownership of it. Um, and he's a, if any of you know him, he's an incredible uh, gentleman, uh, just a wonderful guy. And so uh, over a, several conversations, he finally convinced me that I could help. And then I had to convince myself of a couple of things. One was, did I really believe it was an important institution? And, I, and, and that, for me, was a very quick gate to get through. I, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I felt very powerfully that it was an important institution. I do believe that democracy dies in darkness. I think that the, the paper is, resides in Washington, D.C., capital city of the United States of America, the most powerful country in the world, needs a paper like the Washington Post. Um, and uh, so it was easy to decide it's an important institution. I would not have bought and tried to help turn around a financially upside down salty snack food company. You know, I just have better things to do. Um, so that's why for me it was so important that it be, you know, I'm, I might buy a really well run healthy salt food snack company, but that would just be an investment. And so I, I, uh, I so I, that, and then the second gate I had to go through after that was I, I really wanted to convince myself that it wasn't hopeless. 
because if it had been hopeless, you know, also I wouldn't want to um, get involved. Um, but I didn't think it was, and, and, um, and it has turned out to work very, very well. We did one very simple thing, really, which is we switched from, it's been a lot of work, and I don't mean to make it sound simple, the team has done an amazing amount of work, um, and we have a great editor in Marty Barron, and a great publisher in Fred Ryan, and a great technical leader in Shai Lash. I mean, we've got a killer team at the Post, um, but the big kind of strategic change at the Post was flipping it from being a fantastic local regional newspaper to being a fantastic national global newspaper. And the reason we did that is very simple. The internet took away so many gifts from newspapers, mostly their kind of local ad monopolies and so on. Like the internet just dissolved all of the gifts that newspapers had. But the one gift that it brought to the table for newspapers is almost free global distribution because you can do it digitally. And so we refocused on that. And um, we, have to, we had to switch from making a relatively large amount of money per reader on a relatively small number of readers to a small amount of money per reader on a much larger number of readers. And that's what we've, that's what we've done. And so in our time remaining, I have a couple of quick, yeah. real quick ones. Yeah. Who do you emulate? What kind of role model? Yeah, who do you look at? Oh, a bunch of people. You know, I have been a Warren Buffett fan. In the business realm, I've been a Warren Buffett fan since my early 20s. I read the things he writes. Um, I am, um, so he's a very big fan. I think um, kind of of uh, CEOs today out there that I like, again, in the business realm, um, Jamie Dimon, I think. if. There are a couple of CEOs that I think if I were a big shareholder in J.P. Morgan Chase, I would just show up every Monday morning with like pastries and coffee for Jamie, and I'd be like, so you happy? You good? Because um, I think he's a, tr a terrific executive in a, in a very complicated company. Um, same thing Bob Iger at Disney, I think is a, f a superb executive. Um, so probably, probably bring him pastries. Uh, so there are a lot of role Healthy models. Pastries. Healthy pastries. Well, yeah, I guess I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> you know, that's right. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then outside of that, you know, I've had lots of role models throughout my life. Yeah, um, some of my teachers at River Oaks Elementary School that you mentioned. I had, um, you know, I had my parents who I talked about a little earlier. I didn't talk too much about my grandfather, but he was a gigantic influence in my life. I had the great good fortune, because my mom was so young, um, my grandparents would take me every summer, starting at age four, every summer, kind of to give her a break, really, um, for the whole summer. So I'd be with my grandparents, and on their ranch in Catula, Texas, which is halfway between San Antonio and Laredo. We lived in Houston, and uh, so we would make the five-hour drive out to Catula. They'd drop me off, spend a couple of days there, then they'd go back to Houston. I'd spend the summer. And I went every day to the ranch uh, with my grandfather to help. Now, a four-year-old boy on a ranch in South Texas is not a lot of help. Um, but I didn't know that. I thought I was helping, and um, and then as I, by the time I was 16, I actually was helping. So I have, you know, I I can I can suture up a prolapsed cow. I can fix windmills. Um, my grandfather was so resourceful, and that he made his own veterinary needles. He would take a little piece of wire and pound it flat with a uh, with like a oxyacetylene torch and uh, then drill a little hole through it. And then we would do, we did all of our own veterinary work. Some of the cattle even survived. And um, uh, so we had, but we had great fun out there. You know, um, we built barns and welded things and he bought a D6 uh, Caterpillar bulldozer used, it was like 1955 model year for $5,000. It was completely broken. The gears were stripped. And then we spent, you know, a whole summer repairing that. And the first thing we had to do to repair it was build a crane to take the gears out of the transmission. And so, you know, what I learned from watching him was just how resourceful he was. He didn't ever call a repairman. He figured it out. 
And I do think that that's one of the things that, you know, super lucky for me to grow up in that environment where you got to see resourcefulness in action. So my grandfather, giant uh, role model for me. Jeff, you are, uh, you're an American icon, and these stories really reflect how grounded you are. And, and starting a company from the time where you were doing it yourself uh, to where you are today and to maintain that touch that you have at the same time that you have this vision um, is really uh, what leadership is all about. The Bush Center, we focus on developing and recognizing leadership, and that's what we're doing this week. Um, our time is up, and I do want to uh, thank you. I also want to remind people that in honor of our fifth anniversary of the Bush Center, our friends at Northern Trust have made it free of charge to go through the Bush Library and Museum starting today and extending through next Friday. So thank you for that. Thank you to our wonderful friends uh, at SMU. Thank you all for being here. Please join me in thanking one of the great Americans. <laughs>